السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والضحى والليل إذا سجى ما ودعك ربك وما قلى وللآخرة خير لك من الأولى ولسوف يعطيك ربك فترضى ألم يجدك يتيما فآوى ووجدك ضالا فهدى ووجدك عائلا فأغنى فأما اليتيم فلا تقهر وأما السائل فلا تنهر وأما بنعمة ربك فحدث Enlighten your hearts with a loud salawat for Muhammad and Ali Muhammad <laughs> Prophethood, Nubuwa and the succession, the imama are interwoven and intertwined. They integrate one another. They complement one another. Prophethood Nubuwa is in need to the imama for its journey to be completed, for the completion of the journey, the success of the journey, the Prophet and a prophethood needs the successor, the Imamah. Likewise, the Imamah succession also is in need to the prophethood for its legitimacy, for its credibility. The Imam needs the Prophet. And thus, we find in this book, in our holy book, there is a reference to the Nubuwa and the Imama. And when God speaks about these three pillars, monotheism in chapter 5, Tawheed, Tawheedullah, and the prophethood and the Imama, the succession, he says, Innama waliyukum Allah wa rasuluhu walladheena amanu. Ladina amanu is reference to the Imama, to the succession, to the wilaya. They integrate each other. Tawheed cannot work, cannot function without prophethood. We cannot have direct access to God. God lives in our life. He is a present. He is eminent. He is a close. He is a closer to us than our jugular vein. وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ God is very close. The closest thing to you, closer than your parents, than your spouse, children, friends, is God. But how do you get access to God? How do you recognize Him? How do you know Him if you don't read His book, His revelation? And if God does not send the prophets and messengers to introduce Him to us, how do we get to know Him? Through what channel? Do you see God in your dream? Do you believe in Him through your dreams? Therefore, God 
needs the Prophet. He sends the Prophet because of the necessity. And without the Prophet, we cannot understand God, neither we can have access to Him. And without the Imam, we cannot understand the Prophet. Neither we can understand God. Man arad Allah bada'a bikum. In Ziyarat al Jami'ah, which has been narrated by the 10th Imam, Imam Ali al Hadi alayhi salatu was salam, he says, Whoever seeks to reach to God, to understand God, bada'a bikum. You are the gate. This building has a gate. If these gates are shut, these gates, the emergency, the main entrance, if they are closed, if they are shut, we cannot have access to this building. You have access to the building through the gate. When you go back home tonight, how are you going to enter your room, your house? Through what? Through the roof? Through the gate. وَأْتُ الْبُيُوتَ مِنْ أَبْوَابِهَا Quran says, when you enter a building, a house, a home, whether yours or others, min abwabiha, through the gates. God has a gate, spiritual gate. And that spiritual gate are Muhammadun wa Ali Muhammad. And tomorrow, inshallah, Friday night, I'm going to elaborate further on <clears throat> The correlation, the connection, the relationship between prophethood, nubuwa, and succession, the imamah in the Holy Quran, in the Holy Quran. And they are inseparable, indivisible, these two entities. And therefore, Musa alayhi salam in Surah Taha, chapter 20, when God asked him to begin his mission and to go to the Pharaoh, what did he ask? What did Musa say? Qala Rabbi shrahli sadri. First, I have some defects. And if I don't fix these defects, these mistakes, these weaknesses, I cannot be a messenger. I cannot be a good messenger. I cannot deliver. So first he began with himself asking, Asking the fixation of himself. Qala Rabbi shrahli sadri. Give me tolerance, patience, endurance, sabr, so I can tolerate, so I don't get defeated easily, I don't get tired, I don't get disappointment, disappointed, I don't get frustrated, I don't run away, I don't quit my job. Rabbi shrahli sadri. Wa li amri. Make this job easy for me. Taysir. Wahlul uqdatam min lisani. I am not eloquent when I speak. So remove this knot from my mouth, from my tongue, so I can speak eloquently. And then he says, Waj'alli waziran min ahli. I need extra things. I need a helper, an aid, a minister, a support. One of my own family, not stranger, not outside my family. Someone that I can relate to him. He understands me and I understand him. Waj'alli waziran min ahli. And he mentions his wazir. Haruna akhi. Ushdud bihi azri. Support me with him. Give me a boost through him. Wa ashrikhu fi amri. And make him my partner in this business. In the business of da'wah, in the business of invitation, in this difficult task, I need a partner. I need a comrade. I need a companion. I need a support. God said to him, Qala qad ya Musa. Yes, we will grant you all your needs because you need them. Otherwise, without these needs, you cannot function. You cannot go and stand before Pharaoh. Historians, commentators 
of the Quran say that the same request which was made 2,000 years before by Musa السلام, was made again by Prophet Muhammad The Prophet said, O oh Allah, my brother Musa, referring to him as a brother, my brother Musa asked you to grant him a helper, an aid, wazir, one of his own family. And I am asking you the same request. If Musa asked you to make Aaron, Harun, his aid, his senior aide, his helper, I am asking you to make my cousin and a brother, Ali ibn Abi Talib, my helper and my aide. And God granted the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam his request. Imamah is embedded in prophethood. Imamah is embedded in monotheism. There is no separation between them. For people who believe that the Prophet left his community without successor, this is the biggest insult to God. This is the biggest insult to the Prophet Muhammad This is an insult to all religions. In another word, they are claiming that God left the nation with no guidance. And God from day one made a pledge. And I am going to speak about this tomorrow evening. This is in the beginning of the Quran. This is in Surah Al-Baqarah, the very beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number three, 30. قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً Before the creation, before he created Adam, and therefore, philosophers, they say, Al-Khalifatu Qabla Al-Khaliqa. God created an imam, a khalifa, a vicegerent, before creating the creation, before our creation. He appointed a leader. Now you tell me the Prophet leaves his community and he dies and he has no successor, no khalifa, no imam to rule, doesn't make sense. There are several milestones in the history of Islam and the Prophet, important milestones in the life of the Prophet where historians did not do justice to Prophet Muhammad And I'm going to show you. I have few references with me tonight. And I'm going to show you how historians did not do. Those are major historians. Those are primary historians. Those are world-renowned scholars and historians. But they failed in doing justice to their Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They manipulated some of the events. They concealed the truth. They altered the truth. Why? So they stay away, divert the attention of the people from this connection, this relationship, this correlation between Nubuwa, prophethood, and Imam, succession. They don't want you to know about that. They don't want you to learn about that in the Quran. They don't want you to know that there is a strong correlation from day one, strong interdependency between Nubuwa and Imama. They are inseparable from each other. They integrate each other. They don't want you to know that. And these events are mentioned by major historians. And when we speak about Muslim historians, let me give you an example. Muslim historians are not sacred. They are not holy. 
they are ordinary people, but they were talented. They were gifted in writing the history. Now we have some people who are talented. When they write a book, they, they, they write a bestseller book. Not anyone is endowed with this ability, with this talent. This is a talent. This is a gift. So those historians were not holy people. They were like journalism today, journalists today. In some countries where democracy is absent, a newspaper, a magazine, a blog, a journalist, most of the time, most of the time they work for the government. Even if they don't like the government, they fear the government. They don't dare to write something against the president's will, the political establishment's will, because they are going to be jailed. If they speak their mind, if they report the truth, they're going to be jailed. In many Muslim countries, this is the case. So they have always, always, they have to bear in mind that I have to please the political establishment, the caliph, the ruler, the president. Otherwise, I lose my job, I lose my freedom, and sometimes I lose my life. This is the case. This was exactly the case during the early Islam with those historians. The earliest history of a Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as Nabawiyyah the history of the Prophet is called in Arabic, has a special term. The history of the Prophet is called as Siratun Nabawiyya. This is the oldest account of as Siratun Nabawiyya, Siratu Ibn Hisham. Of course, Ibn Hisham, he copy paste from Muhammad Ibn Ishaq, the first one who documented the Sirah the seerah of the Prophet, the history of the Prophet, the biography of the Prophet was a man by the name of Muhammad ibn Ishaq who died 152 Hijri. What year did the Prophet die? 11. 11. 11. The Prophet died 11 Hijri. Muhammad ibn Ishaq died 152. How many years between him and the Prophet? 141 years. Imagine, this is the earliest account of the Prophet's life. Prophet's life, 141 years after the death of the Prophet. There is no account before that. This man came 141 years after the Prophet, and now he's telling you and me and the world how the Prophet lived. What did he do today and yesterday and last month and next year? And that man left no book. His book, you cannot find the book of Muhammad ibn Ishaq, disappeared. Someone came by the name of Ibn Hisham, Ibn Hisham, and he copied the book of Muhammad ibn Ishaq. And Ibn Hisham came almost 60 years after Muhammad ibn Ishaq, because Muhammad ibn Ishaq died 152, Ibn Hisham died 218 Hijri. This is his book. That is the oldest and the earliest account of the Prophet's life. This journalist, Ibn Hisham, when he wrote his book, which is three volumes, this is one of them. I could not bring the other two. This is volume number one. See what he says in the beginning. He was incorporated by the Abbasite Caliph to write the book. Which Abbasite Caliph? The Abbasite Caliph who murdered Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wassalam. His name is Al-Mansur al-Abbasi. Mansur who built the city of Baghdad. Mansur who murdered thousands of the Shia of Ahlul Bayt, the followers of Ahlul Bayt. Mansur who used to capture the followers of Ali and Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam, and he orders his soldiers to bury them alive 
alive. Bury them and build the walls of Baghdad over their bodies. This is how Baghdad was built. The city of Baghdad was built. The foundations of the city, the pillars of the city, the walls of the city was built on the skeleton and the bones of the followers of Ali and Fatima al-Zahra by the order of Mansur al-Abbas. Ibn Hisham says, I've written this book, and this is volume one for those of you who'd like to research. This is volume number one. This is page. <clears throat> this is the introduction, of course. This is the introduction, page 25. He says, Ibn Ishaq, the one I am copying from his book, the one who was before me, he دخل على المنصور ببغداد. He visited the caliph, the Abbasid caliph, Al-Mansur. Bani Umayya murdered four imams. Imam Al-Hassan by the order of Muawiyah. Imam Al-Hussein by the order of Yazid. Imam Ali ibn Al-Hussein and Imam Muhammad Al-Baqir. Bani Al-Abbas, the Abbasid murdered six imams. Six Imams. Imam al-Sadiq by the order of Mansur. Imam, after Imam al-Sadiq, Imam Musa al-Kadhim by the order of Harun. After him, Imam Ali ibn Musa al-Rida by the order of Ma'mun. After him, the son of Imam al-Rida, Imam Muhammad al-Jawad by the order of Al-Mu'tasim al-Abbasi. After him, Imam Ali al-Hadi alayhi salam by the order of Al-Mu'tamad al-Abbasi, Al-Mu'taz, sorry, Al-Mu'taz al-Abbasi. After him, the murder of Imam Hassan al-Askari, the 11th Imam, by the order of Al-Mu'tamad al-Abbasi. <coughs> Abbasid caliphs murdered six Imams. And Ibn Ishaq came to visit in Mansur, who murdered Imam al-Sadiq. وَبَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ إِبْنُهُ الْمَهْدِي Mansur had a son called Mahdi. He said to him, قال المنصور, said to Ibn Ishaq, the historians, he said to him, do you know this? Do you know this boy? Ibn Ishaq said, no, sorry, I don't know him. He said, this is my son. This is my son. اذهب فصنف له كتابا منذ خلق الله تعالى منذ خلق الله تعالى آدم عليه السلام إلى يومك هذا. I want you to write a book from the creation of Adam, the day God created Adam, until today for my spoiled boy whose name is Al-Mahdi. So the seerah of the Prophet, the oldest seerah, seerah number one, book number one, that all other historians who came later on, they copied from that seerah, which is now is lost, the original book is lost. They all took their information from Muhammad ibn Ishaq. And Muhammad ibn Ishaq wrote his book at the order of whom? Mansur al-Abbasi. Why? Because he wants his little boy to understand history, the book of history. This is the story of the seer of the Prophet. Do you expect these books to be authentic, to speak the truth? A book which is written to please the son of the caliph. Do you expect these books to be authentic, to be pro Ahlul Bayt, pro Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa sallam? This is, in a brief, the history, the history of those historians, those who documented the seerah, the life of the Prophet. And now, millions of Muslims, not just now, for, for the last 1,200 years, are reading these books and memorizing them, and they believe in every line and every word in these books. Do you understand why Islam is going in the wrong direction? Muslims are moving in the wrong direction? Are you surprised? Are you surprised? This is when the source of knowledge is twisted, is not authentic. 
when the source of knowledge tries to please the Sultan, the Caliph, because he's on the payroll of the Caliph. This is the result. No one is going to know the truth. The truth is going to be lost. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah to Bani Israel and through them to us, the Muslim Ummah, the Muslim nation. وَلَا تَلْبِسُوا الْحَقَّ بِالْبَاطِلِ وَتَكْتُمُوا الْحَقَّ وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ Don't, don't commit this crime. Do not confuse truth with, with falsehood. Don't. وَلَا تَلْبِسُوا الْحَقَّ بِالْبَاطِلِ Neither conceal the truth while you know the truth, but you conceal it because you want to please the government, the political establishment. Don't do this. This is a crime against the humanity. Speak the truth. Tell the truth. Don't conceal it. So what are these four events or five events? I'm going to choose some of them tonight and see how they twist the truth. See how they lie. One of them is when they come to the adoption of Imam Ali alayhi salam by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imam Ali in Nahj al balagha he says, when I was a child, when I was a kid, وضعني رسول الله في حجره وأنا وليد. وليد in Arabic means a newborn baby. Walid means newborn baby. Walid is taken from wilada. Wilada is when a mother gives birth, delivery of the baby. So I was Walid, newborn. Took me the Prophet in his lap. He took care of me. He adopted me. He raised me. He trained me. He was teaching me every single day. Every single day he shows me his steps and I follow his steps exactly. فَمَا وَجَدَ لِي خَطْلَةً فِي قَوْلٍ فَمَا وَجَدَ لِي كِذْبَةً فِي قَوْلٍ وَلَا خَطْلَةً فِي فعل. When the Prophet trained me, when I graduated, he never found me to be a liar. I never lied. Because my teacher, my mentor, my leader, my inspiration was the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But look what history says. History wants to disconnect this relationship between the Prophet and the Imam. So they come and they say the reason why the Prophet took Imam Ali, not because he wanted to teach him. No, because Abu Talib, the father of the Prophet, was poor. And there was famine in Mecca. They fabricate the story. A Hollywood story. They say there was a famine in Mecca. And Abu Talib is Kathir al Ayal. He had a huge family. He could not afford to feed his kids. So the Prophet went to his uncle Al Abbas and he said to him, Abbas, my uncle, let's reach out to your brother Abu Talib. He cannot feed his kids. So let, let us sponsor his children. And why Al-Abbas? Because this story happened where, where? This story was fabricated at what time? Huh? At what time? Ahsant, during the Abbasite time. So they want to give the Abbasite, their forefather is Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet. So they want to give him an edge over Ali ibn Abi Talib. They want to say to Ali ibn Abi Talib, see, it was our grandfather who saved your grandfather. It was our grandfather who came, who suggested that we sponsor you and we feed you because your father could not afford feeding you. So then this will be a karama, an honor for Al Abbas because he saved his brother Abu Talib from poverty, from starvation. He did not let his kids die. So Al Abbas is a great man. See how, how how fabrication works hmm? when they work for the regime. So they came to Abu Talib. Abu Talib said, and the story, the drama continues to say, Abu Talib said, okay, keep Aqil for me because I'm attached to Aqil. 
I love Aqil so much. And khudu man shi'tum. And take whoever you want. So Abbas took the first one, Talib. Talib was 38 years old. Aqil stayed with his father, Abu Talib. He was 21, 28 years old. Ja'far, Ja'far was taken by Hamza alayhi salam, the uncle of the Prophet. And Prophet Muhammad was left for Imam Ali. So it wasn't a choice, no. It was a, co a coincidence that Ali was left with no sponsor. So the Prophet said, well, I'll take care of this boy. Bring him here to my house. Whereas we know the truth is, this is the divine will, the divine planning, the divine intention that Ali ibn Abi Talib goes into the custody of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa That Ali at the age of six, even younger than six, has to go to this preschool and this kindergarten and this first grade and second grade and third and fourth and tenth and twentieth. And that school is called the school of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the fact of the matter, if you research history, you find Abu Talib was not poor. Abu Talib was a merchant. Abu Talib was a successful businessman. Abu Talib had several business trips in Arabia and outside Arabia. He was not short on money. In fact, Abu Talib, when he sponsored Prophet Muhammad, Abu Talib sponsored the Prophet. The Prophet, his father died, Abdullah. So he went into the custody of his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. When Abdul Muttalib was about to die on his deathbed, asked Abu Talib, Ya Abu Talib, you take care of Muhammad. Take good care of him. He has a future. This man is going to be the next prophet here for the whole world. So the prophet went into the custody of Abu Talib. And Abu Talib was spending on the prophet the food, the shelter, the clothing, including his marriage. The marriage of the Prophet with Lady Khadija was paid for by Abu Talib alayhi salam. He did not need someone to help him. He was a merchant. Beside, beside, they say Abbas took Talib at the age of 38. Can you believe someone at the age of 38, he needs a sponsor? He needs someone to, be ad to adopt him? Have you seen a kid at the age of 38 being adopted by someone? Talib was 38, okay? Ja'far was, uh, ja was 18, Aqil was 28. They don't need someone to adopt them. But a liar has a short memory. Sometimes they cannot fix the drama very well. So this is one. This is one fallacy. This is one big lie. They introduce Imam Ali as someone who had no, no parent. Nobody is taking care of him. So the Prophet felt pity for him, sorry for him. So come into my custody. Whereas the truth the Prophet took Imam Ali on purpose from day one, from day one, because he wanted to raise him on his own hands. He wanted to prepare him for the succession, for the Imam. Imam Ali is an integral part to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Tonight, on the 28th of Safar, the Prophet, every now and then, he opens his eyes. And he says, Ituni bi Habibi. Where is my sweetheart? Aisha brings her father. The Prophet says, No. Hafsa brings her father, Umar. The Prophet says, No, I said, Ituni bi Habibi. And then he had to say, Ali. Bring Ali to me. I need Ali. They were inseparable from day one. From day one. From day one, Ali and Muhammad were inseparable. From day one. And when the Prophet died, he died on the chest of Imam Ali Imam Ali was holding his head 
Imam Ali was comforting the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tonight when he left and Fatima to Zahra was standing and other people were busy somewhere else in a meeting called Saqifa. They abandoned the Prophet. They left the Prophet. They didn't even come to check upon the Prophet what is happening to him. Because Khilafa and leadership and the seat was more important than their leader, their Prophet Muhammad This is the fact. Until the Prophet was buried, those people were busy, they were absent. None of them attended the burial of the Prophet. I ask you, my friends, if someone important in your community dies and only five people or four people go to his burial, you would not raise a question, why? This is an important person. This is a leader. This is a person who served the community for 20, 30 years. Why only four people are present? What happened to the people? Today we see humble people when they die, 200, 300, 500 people, they go to the cemetery. But you're a prophet when he died, only four people buried him. This is the truth. This is what they did to the prophet. وما محمد إلا رسول قد خلت من قبله الرسل أفإن مات أو قتل انقلبتم انقلبتم You turn back because the seat, the khilafa is more important than honoring and paying a tribute to their leader, to their prophet, the messenger of God is more important. Imam Ali was the one who never left the Prophet. He said, I'm not going to leave him even a second. And this is exactly what the Prophet said. He said, Ya Ali, people are going to abandon me, but I know you're going to stay with me. You are not going to leave me. Don't leave me until you put me in my grave. Don't, and you pour the dirt on my body and then you are free to leave. Don't leave me, Ali. So this is the first incident. The second one, <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in chapter 24, Surah Al-Shu'ara, verse 214 says, وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ O Prophet Muhammad, you have to warn your tribe. Ashiratak means your tribe, Al Aqrabin, your nearest of kin. This was in the beginning of Islam. So the Prophet gathered 40 men of Bani Hashim, his Ashira, his tribe. He gathered them in Mecca. He made food. The story is very famous. And he said, I am sent by God as your messenger. And by the way, his family here, we have a macro family and micro family. The macro family of the Prophet is the Ashira, his tribe. His tribe, Quraysh. Some of those people in Quraysh and even Bani Hashim, some of them were believers, some of them were non-believers. They are the tribe of the Prophet. So not everyone who belongs to the Prophet by blood is considered faithful. Some of them were unfaithful. One of the most unfaithful people who is mentioned in the Quran, what does Quran say about him? He was the uncle of the Prophet. He was the uncle of the Prophet. Imagine, he is the brother of Abdullah, the father of the Prophet. He is the uncle of the Prophet. No one is closer to you than your uncle. But this uncle, Allah says about him, Tabbat yada abi lahabin watab. Ma agna anhu ma luhu wa ma kasab. Because he had jealousy. So not all your family members are good, huh? This is a lesson. Allah is saying not all members of the family prophet are good. There is a macro family, big family. Macro. Many of them were atheists. Many of them were polytheists. Many of them died rejecting God, did not believe in God. 
but then there is a micro family. This micro family is a special, is a small. This micro family is Muhammad, Ali, Fatima, Hassan, and Hussein. This micro family, God says about them in 3333. <laughs> So the Prophet invited them. He said, I have to begin with you, my macro family. Before I go to the strangers, I go to my cousins, my extended family. Am I, I'm inviting you to believe in the oneness of God, monotheism, and to believe that I am the messenger of God. And the third thing, I want someone to support me and help me in my mission, Allah and Yakun. Let me read it from the most important book of history, Tariq al-Tabari. Muhammad ibn Jarir al-Tabari, he's Persian. He's from Amul on the Caspian Sea. This man, Muhammad ibn Jarir al-Tabari, is considered in Sunni Islam, is considered the first Mufassir, Imam al mufassirin because he has Tafsir and he has Tariq. He has history, book of history, 20 volumes, and 30 volumes is his tafsir. This man is considered in Sunni Islam, if you research him, when it comes to tafsir, the exegesis of Quran, he is considered Imam al Mufassirin, number one. No one can contest with this man, Muhammad ibn Jarir, in his tafsir. No one in Sunni Islam. After him becomes another Persian man, which is, no, which is Ibn al-Khatib, al Ibn al-Khatib, uh, the other Persian who, who died in, 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 in Shahra Ray, in Ray, in Khurasan. That is the second Mufassir. But the first one is Muhammad ibn Jarir al-Tabari. This is his tafsir. This is his tarikh, history. Look at the contradiction between two stories. Same man, huh? same man, writing two books, but he changes his story. And I'm going to tell you why he changes his story. In Tariq, he says, when the Prophet came, then he asked help. He said to, him, to, to Bani Hashim, he said to them, who's going to support me in my mission? فَأَيُّكُمْ يُعَذِرُنِي This is... This is volume two, volume two, page 203, for those who want to research. Who's going to support me on this mission, which is Islam, inviting people to Islam, provided that he is going to be, if he supports me now, he's going to be Akhi, my brother, my trustee, my successor. See? They started laughing. Nobody answered him. They said, listen, we don't even recognize you as a prophet. You want us to support you? We don't recognize you as a prophet. You are claiming to be prophet. Three times the prophet repeat, repeats the sentence, only a young man who was only 13 years old. He stands. He says, Ya Rasulullah, I am. I am going to give my life for you. The Prophet says, Ya Ali, sit down. Let me listen to others. Three times. At the end, when nobody responded to the Prophet, the Prophet took the hand of Ali. He said, I want you to bear witness that this young man is going to be my brother, my trustee, wasayi, wa khalifati alaykum. So they burst in laughter. They were sarcastic. They turned to Abu Talib who was sitting there. They said, hey, 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 Abu Talib, Muhammad, your nephew, is asking you to listen to your son Ali, sarcastically. So you have to obey your little boy, Ali. So he says this story. But come here to his tafsir. See how he changes the story. Why he changes the story? Because when he, he spoke the truth in his book, history book, there was a pressure on him. 
those who hated Ahl al-Bayt, they threatened his life. They said to him, you made a mistake. You have to correct this mistake. So when he started writing his tafsir, he omitted this. Let me show you. Come to his tafsir. This is volume 11. Volume 11 in the tafsir of the ayah, وَأَنذَرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ he says, فَأَيُّكُمْ يُؤَازِرُنِي عَلَى هَذَا الْأَمْرِ The Prophet is asking his family, who's going to support me in this mission? عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَكُونَ أَخِي Provided that if he supports me today, he's going to be my brother. وَكَذَا 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 And such and such. He does not mention وَصِيِّ وَخَلِيفَتِي Same author with a difference of a few years. Because when he wrote this, he's from Iran, he was in Amul, but then he moved to Baghdad. Baghdad was under the control of the Hanabila, the followers of Ahmad ibn Hanbal, and they accused him, they accused Muhammad ibn Jarir al-Tabari to be either Shia or pro-Shia. So we know how to silence you. And they surrounded his house. He was like a hostage. He had no choice. So to please them, he omitted wasiyyi wa khalifati. See what politics does, my friends. He's buried. Muhammad ibn Jarir, I respect him. I respect him. He's buried in Baghdad. If you go one day to Baghdad and you have time, and it's not in the summer, boiling, 130 Fahrenheit, go and visit his grave. He has a grave. Al-Imam al-Tabari. He was born in Amul, but buried in Baghdad. This is what politics does. But here, what is worse is that this incident, which is so popular, and the Prophet from day one appointed Imam Ali, which is the biggest evidence that Ali is the successor of the Prophet, not during the last days of the Prophet, during the first days of his mission when he was in Mecca, when the number of Muslims were only five, only five, the Prophet appointed him as a successor. This is story, when it comes to the most senior person who wrote the seerah of the Prophet, he does not mention it. Ibn Hisham does not mention it in his book anywhere, anywhere. Because the Abbasites, they don't like this. They don't like this story. And he, he, he himself says, if you have time, if you want me to show you that, he says, I am not going to copy the entire seerah of Muhammad ibn Ishaq, because if I does so, if I do so, some people are going to be upset with me, meaning the regime. So I am forced to omit and delete many of the stories. He, he admits in his book. And when others, they come and mention the story, like Ibn Taymiyyah, he does mention the story, but he says there is no evidence that the Prophet appointed. He, he completely deny the story. He negates the story that these things are the fabrications of Rawafil. Rawafil. The Ummah did a great injustice to the Prophet. And I can go on and on and on citing many other examples, how they did injustice to their prophet, and how the prophet is the first mazloom before his daughter was abused, before his grandson Hussein was abused, before his son-in-law Ali was abused, before the rest of his family, he himself was the first victim of abuse not by foreigners or strangers, by people who claim to be his followers, by people who mention his name in their adhan and iqamah and the prayers, but yet they do not follow his sunnah, they do not follow his commands. And the biggest disaster, my friends, is Raziyatul Khamis, Bukhari, Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari, number one a transmitter of hadith in Sunni Islam, mentions this story seven times throughout his book. This disaster. It's called the disaster of Thursday. The Prophet died on Monday. 
This disaster took place four days before his death. Raziyatul Khamis. What happened? When the Prophet asked the companions to leave Medina. Why? Because he wanted a smooth transition of power from him to Ali ibn Abi Talib. He said, all the companions have to leave except Ali. Ali stays with me. They realized that the Prophet is going to die. And of course, they don't want to leave because they were eyeing the seat of the Khilafah. So when he opened his eyes four days before his death on Thursday, he saw the room was filled with those companions. And in fact, the Prophet mentioned four of them by name that you must leave. One of them is Abu Bakr. Second is Umar. Third is Ubaidah ibn Jarrah, Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah. Fourth one, and those three are the orchestrators of Saqifah. The one who created Saqifah, orchestrated Saqifah, directed Saqifah, were these three. Only three of the Muhajireen. Only three of the entire community of Muhajireen, they went inside the Saqifah. They attacked the Ansar, Abu Bakr, Umar, and Abu Ubaid ibn Jarrah. The Prophet asked them, and he asked the fourth one, you have to leave Medina too. Go with Osama, with the military excursion of Osama, and fight the Roman who are on the border of Medina, north of Medina. The fourth one was Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, another one who hated Imam Ali. And his son, Umar ibn Sa'd, murdered Imam Hussein in Karbala. The Prophet said, you four have to leave. Only the only man stays in Medina is Ali. They realized. They realized what is going to happen. They refused. So the, the Prophet, when he opened his eyes, and he said to them, why you are here? I want you to anfidu ba'tha Usama. Allah man an ba'thi Usama. May God curse those who stay behind and don't go with Usama. They, they did not listen to him. Eventually, the Prophet had to say his historic statement, which is written in Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, all history books, seven times in Sahih al-Bukhari, throughout his book, seven times. Now that you don't want to go, bring me a pen and paper. لأكتب لكم كتابا لن تضلوا بعد أبدا. So I can write you a book, a statement that if you implement this statement, you would never be misguided. لن تضلوا بعد أبدا. So there was a commotion. There was a disagreement. Some of them said, let 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 us give him the pen and paper. He's dying. Let's see what he wants to write. Bukhari says. وَفِي الْبَيْتِ رِجَالٌ فِيهِمْ عُمَرٌ In the house of the Prophet, in the room of the Prophet, there are men, among them Umar. All of a sudden, Umar said, don't give him pen and paper. إِنَّ الرَّجُلَ لَيَهْجُرْ He is hallucinating. Muhammad, the Prophet, where Allah says, وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ Every sentence, that this prophet utters is a revelation. He does not speak out of his desire. Everything he speaks is revelation from God. Today, he is being described and accused of being hallucinating. Of course, Umar, after so many years during his relationship, he admitted to, to Abdullah ibn Abbas, one day he saw Abdullah ibn Abbas. He said to him, is your friend Ali still upset? Abdullah ibn Abbas said, yes, of course, ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. He's still upset. He said, upset of what? He said, because upset because you did not want the Prophet to write his will. Umar said, of course, I did not want the, the Prophet to write his will because if he's going to write a will, he is going to put the name of Ali in his will. He is going to say, Ali is my successor. And Quraysh cannot tolerate this. Cannot tolerate that a prophet is from Bani Hashim. 
and the Khalifa, the Imam from Bani Hashim too. This is too much for us. So I had to abort that. I had to stop the Prophet from writing his will. That is the biggest disaster. The Prophet left his Ummah with pain in his heart and also knowing that his daughter Fatima is going to be abused. The house of Fatima is going to be attacked. He knew this is going to happen. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. He said to Imam Ali alayhi salam, the last hours of his life, Ya Ali, in a few hours from now, I am going to leave. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed me through reviewing the Quran with me twice this year that my ajal, my departure is very imminent. Ya Ali, I want you to stay with me. Ya Ali, there will be a fitna, commotion. I want you to be patient. If people listen to you, then it is good for them. If they don't listen to you, I don't want any fitna to take a place, no bloodshed to take a place. You have to be patient, Ya Ali. And then for almost two weeks, the Prophet ﷺ was bedridden. He could not move. And the last three days, he did not go to the mosque. He did his prayers while on his deathbed. He could not go to the mosque. And then on that day, which is Monday, most likely it was Monday the Prophet left this life. Fatima to Zahra was standing there looking at her father's face. Hassan and Hussein came. They threw themselves on the Prophet. Imam Ali wanted to remove them. The Prophet said, Ya Abu Hassan, da'ni ashummuhuma wa yashummani. Allow me, give me some time, Ya Abel Hassan. I want to smell Hassan and Hussein. I want to hug them. This is the last hug. I'm going to leave them soon. And they're going to suffer after me. And then while the Prophet was on his deathbed, someone knocked at the door. Lady Fatima went to open the door. She found an Arab man. He said, I want to see the Prophet. She said to him, Ya Hada, my father is in pain. He cannot even speak. So he left. This man left. After a few minutes came back, he knocked at the door again. He said, I want to speak the Prophet to the Prophet. Lady Fatima said to him, I told you my father, he cannot speak. He's in so much pain. The third time when he came and he knocked at the door, the Prophet said, Daughter Fatima, my sweetheart, this is Malakul Maut, allow him to come inside. So he came inside the house. Jibreel was sitting next to the Prophet because the Prophet said to him, Don't leave me during these difficult moments. So he was comforting Rasulullah. Jibreel, when he saw Malakul Maut, the angel of death, he said, Ya Rasulullah, this angel of death never sought permission from anyone before you, nor is going to seek permission from anyone after you. You are the only one who is seeking permission from him to take your soul, Ya Rasulullah. And then Jibreel said, Ya Rasulullah, Al Ali Al A'la Yuqri'uka As Salam. He greets you. He says, If you want to live in this life forever, I will grant this wish for you and I can turn the mountains of the earth as gold and silver for you for the rest of your life. There is no end for your life. But Allah at the same time says, Qad ishtaqtu ilayka ya Habibi Muhammad. I miss you ya Muhammad and I want you to come back to me. The Prophet answered, Wa ana ishtaqtu ila liqa'i rabbi. Me too, I am longing. To meet my Lord soon. At that time when the Prophet gave permission, he straightened his hand, he faced the Qibla. Imam Ali took his head in his lap on his chest. 
while the Prophet was saying, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. He passed away, Imam Ali said, Ajarakum Allah. Laqad faraqa nabiyyukum ad-dunya. May Allah reward you, your Prophet, Rasulullah has left this life. Lady Fatima came to her father. O oh, Abatah, Ya Rasulullah, Subbat alayya masaibun law annaha. Subbat ala al-ayyam, sirna layaliya. We remained lonely after you, Ya Rasulullah. You are our leader, our father, our defender. We are now strangers without you, Ya Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayka, Ya Rasulullah. Ya khayra khalqillah. Ya Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Azzamallahu ujurakum. We listen now to Hajj Samir for the lamentation and the aza of our dear Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam.